Circles 9 analysis. I've been working as a stress analyst for a little over three years on a variety of projects, uh, many of which I've had to utilize inertia relief for running some of our uh, full vehicle models. Um, so in this webinar today, we're going to go over uh, what inertia relief is and uh, how it can be used. We're going to go through setting up a static analysis uh, with inertia relief inside FEMAP, and then we're going to talk about uh, recovering some of the output data uh, that inertia relief will give you in your FO6 file. So let's go ahead and get started. So just to start, I kind of want to briefly go over uh, a little bit about static analysis using finite element method. So when you're running a static analysis, uh, there's a few assumptions that go into uh, running that using the finite element method. One is that this is a, it's a linear uh, relationship. So you have a linear relation between your, your loads and uh, your displacements. You're also at the assumption that you're in the elastic region for your materials. You also assume that there's a, your model is in a state of static equilibrium and that there's no rigid body motion. Uh, you could get a fatal for a singular matrix is another keyword if, uh, if you have a rigid body motion. But in, in a static analysis, a constraint is required. Uh, and the reason is because uh, otherwise your matrix would be singular and it, you'd get a fatal that wouldn't run. So as an example here, we can see a leading edge assembly of a wing, uh, and it's constrained all on the back side of the, the main spar web. So what you can do with an assembly like this is, you know, uh, make your mesh, put all the parts in, apply your loads, and you can kind of get some details about, you know, what your stresses look like, what kind of deflections are you seeing, um, and this is very useful for uh, sizing and analyzing small assemblies, working it through the detailed design. But ultimately, this part is going to have to uh, get back into a full model, and you're going to have to run a full vehicle model or a load spam to really get the full internal loads uh, accurately in this area. So for that case, you'd be running your full vehicle models uh, So some cases of a full vehicle model that you, uh, uh, examples that you might model are here we have the uh, Airbus Vahana. This is uh, one of the projects we worked on. Um, and here you see it in, in the hover mode, but it also transitions to normal flight. Um, but here it's hovering, right? And you could model this uh, using uh, inertia relief where you would not necessarily want to put a constraint on this because it's not necessarily constrained anywhere. Um, but you still want to be able to run your models accurately. Another good example is uh, anything that's in orbit. So here we have on the right, the Hubble telescope is in orbit around the Earth. Um, this could also be analyzed using inertia relief, because in the same sense, it's in static equilibrium, but it's not necessarily constrained. So what exactly is inertia relief? Inertia relief, as a general description, is a way uh, for us to constrain our model by using not a constraint, but really the inertia of the model itself. So if you have an accelerating aircraft, right, that means it has a net force acting on it. And because it has a net force, it also has to have an equal and opposite force uh, that's reacting on it uh, because of the aircraft's mass. right? Now, when you think of this force, it's really an acceleration, um, but it's also known as the inertial loads. So an example we can have here is let's say you have increased lift on your aircraft. So the increased lift on the wings wants to bend the wings upward. But since you have an equal and opposite force, you're going to have some accelerations in the opposite direction, and this will actually relieve some of your wing bending. 
this becomes an important effect um, because when you're relieving that wing bending, right, you're actually taking some of the, the stress out of your wing. The bending moment will be smaller. Right? If you look at this plot here, um, we can see that the red line is what our lift distribution is. Right? And then we have two other lines here for weight in, of the wing and fuel that's inside the wing. If you sum all those together, you get some total lift distribution on your wing. That's less than the actual lift distribution that you're applying to it. So if you were to simply just constrain your model and run it just with a standard linear static analysis and you neglect any inertial effects, you're actually putting more load into your structure than is actually going to be there. And this would be conservative, but you could be making a heavier design. So how the inertia relief plays in static analysis is that it allows you to run your model without defining any constraints. Instead, it'll add a step to calculate um, your rigid body accelerations from the applied loads on your model. And then it applies the opposite accelerations to invoke a, a state of equilibrium on your model. Uh, inertia relief is supported for uh, NASH TRAN Linear Static Solution 101. It's also supported for the linear static portions of Solutions 105 and Solution 200. So one thing that's worth noting is um, the use of grab cards when you're using inertia relief. Um, because the uh, inertia relief is going to be applying accelerations to counteract your rigid body motion, any acceleration that you would use in the form of a grab card um, would just get canceled out completely because one acceleration is just canceled out by an equal and opposite acceleration. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're when you're using this. So now we're going to uh, open up VMAP where we have a model and we're going to set up a few runs um, using inertia relief. And we're also going to set up a run without using inertia relief and we're going to compare the results that we get. So here we have a full aircraft model, and I'm going to go ahead and show the loads on this model. We have a, a 3.5 G lift across uh, the wing here. So what I went ahead and did is to start, if we zoom in, you see that I added a constraint here in all six degrees of freedom, and I've connected it using a rigid element uh, to some stiff structure in the fuselage. And what we're going to do first is we're going to run this as a normal linear static run without inertia relief. And we're just going to look at some of these results. So here I have the results already pulled up. And we'll go ahead and deform this model. And as you would expect, I have the undeformed model plotted here, but the wings bend upward, right? That's, that's what we expect to happen from this type of load case. We notice that the deformation is 42 and a half inches, roughly. And what we can also do is uh, let's visualize some stresses here. I've chosen laminate failure index, um, and you can see we get a nice contour through the spar and in the skins. So the second run that we're going to do is using inertia relief. So let's go ahead and just walk through setting up one of these 
analyses here. So when you first open it up, you're going to be choosing a linear static analysis, just like you would if you're running any, any standard static analysis. And we're going to come here to our bulk data options, and we want to uh, focus on two parameters here. One is this INREL parameter. This is your inertia relief. Right? So this needs to be checked. And we're going to set it to uh, minus two, which is automatic. This is the recommended uh, solution for inertia relief because it, it calculates the, uh, it finds the reference point for you when it's calculating your uh, inertia relief accelerations. And there's no other manual options that are needed to do that, uh, on the user side. So we choose minus two for automatic. And the other thing is this ground point uh, parameter. This uh, is not required if you're running automatic, but typically uh, when you're reading your output, it's going to be summed about this point that you choose. If you leave it zero, that means you're choosing the default option, which is it sums everything about the uh, origin. Uh, however, this parameter changes nothing about uh, what the inertia relief calculation is actually doing. So we'll run through that. Everything else stays the same as if you were running a regular static analysis. But what you'll notice is that we have no constraints. We don't need them because our inertia relief is going to invoke our static equilibrium for us. So when you end up running that, we'll go ahead and open up Uh, the results for this case. And we'll deform it. The wings bend just like we would expect. But we do notice that now we have 36, almost 37 inches of deflection. Whereas in the other, the other case, we had 42. So let's go ahead and zoom in here a little bit. And I'm going to switch between the constrained model and the inertia relief model. What you'll notice is that, for starters, where I constrained it, it can't move. So the fuselage can't move up and down. In the inertia relief run, though, the fuselage is still free to move, although it's still in a static state of equilibrium. What we also want to do is let's look at our stress contours. So as we discussed earlier in the slides, uh, if you run just a linear static analysis without assuming any inertial effects are, are in the problem, you're actually putting more bending into your wings than is actually going to be there. Um, so as you can see here, we have a lot of green uh, on our contour here, which is around a 0.6 uh, for failure index. And I'll pull up some strain values as well. But if I just go ahead and uh, reactivate the output for the constraint model, you, you, you can already see that it's there's a lot more low going in there because your failure index is getting higher. Now we have more yellow here in the back, which is a 0.8 failure index. There's more bending going on in your wing here because there's no inertial effects uh, to relieve the bending. Let's see if we can't pull some strain off of this. So we'll come in here and change our, our output contour. to go out to load, but almost 2,000, I see, 2,500 micro strain. And let's go back to the inertia relief one real quick, and let's see how much it changes, too. 
2200. Let's make sure I'm in my in my spar area. That's where I really want to know it. All right, it's almost like 2800. So that's one thing to check uh, if you're, you know, if you're running it with inertia relief or not inertia relief. I have found that with really long wings, as is our model on this one, um, weight of the structure actually becomes very uh, important to add as well to your calculations. Whereas in a small wing, the weight might not matter as much compared to fuel mass. Um, so we ran that with automatic inertia relief. Another thing you can do is use what's called manual inertia relief. So let's run through setting up one of those real quick and disc discuss some of the differences. In this case, we have inertia relief checked, ground point checked. The ground point will be checked automatically, but in this case we have minus one selected instead of minus two. And we had to actually put in here a nodal ID. So this is node ID 356. This is actually the node that I placed my constraint on earlier. And we'll talk about that in a second. If we keep going to our boundary conditions, you'll notice we still have no constraints set but I did have to define a support one card. So to define a support one card within FEMAP, it's easy, you just define a constraint. But what this constraint is actually doing is it's telling NASTRAN which degrees of freedom do you want to uh, balance out for your rigid body accelerations. So in my case, I chose all six degrees of freedom, which is three translation and three rotation. And if I put all six degrees of freedom on my support one card, then it's going to balance out my rigid body accelerations in all six degrees of freedom. So this is an extra step that you have to take uh, to, for manual inertia relief, which is defining the support card and also defining the ground point, because now your ground point parameter is required, and all the calculations are going to be done about that point, whereas an automatic uh, the ground point only affects where your output uh, is summed about for mass, uh, forces, inertias, accelerations. Um, and I can show you that once we look at some of the outputs. So when we run that manual inertia relief, we can go ahead and we'll, act put, we'll activate this, uh, this output vector as well, and we'll deform it. And let's compare some of the results here real quick. Number one, we see 37, almost 38 inches of flexion, which is a little more uh, compared to uh, the automatic inertia relief. But the stresses are going to be the same. And I'll show you in a sec. Once I get my contour set up, we'll show some stresses. So we see that this stress contour looks uh, similar to what the automatic inertia relief front looks like. So then why do I have 37, almost 38 inches deflection when in the other one I had uh, 36? Well, that's because of my support card, because now I chose my ground point at that point, and you can see that my fuselage is not moving up and down anymore. In my automatic inertia relief run, the fuselage was free to move up and down. This does not change any of your stress results, though. If you were to query stress of elements using this manual output or the automatic output, you'd find the same values. The only difference is that uh, it's relative to one point. Uh, well, the points that it's using as a reference point are different, that's all. So since my fuselage was allowed to uh, move down a little bit in the automatic run, my actual total deformation, which is out on the wingtip, was a little bit lower. So 
So let's say you didn't want to use a nurse relief. Uh, how would you make sure that you're loading your aircraft correctly? Well, you would actually have to go in and, and do the, those calculations on your own and reapply all those loads on your own and then verify that, you know, everything is balanced, everything is in static equilibrium. But even then, you're going to be making some assumptions. And it might be simple for a, a symmetric case. But what happens when you have an asymmetric case? For instance, let's say you hit the rudder, you do a hard rudder maneuver. Just, you just put the rudder as max as it can go. You generate a lot of side force on your tail. That might be a very hard uh, calculation to, to do on your own. Uh, and when in our case, we can just run it using inertia relief and you'll be able to see uh, the reactions and displacements of your aircraft relative to any rigid body motion. So this is what you're seeing right now. I put a max rudder case on here, and I ran this with inertia relief uh, automatic. It has one G lift on the wings and then maximum uh, maximum side force on the tail. And you see you get bending in your tail, you get torsion in your tail, you're also going to get rotation about your Z, rotation about the X, uh, you're going to get translation in the Y. It's a very complicated uh, problem to kind of work out, but by running it inertia relief minus, uh, minus two, which is automatic, you don't have to worry about any of those inertia loads. It's all taken care of. So let's go back into the presentation and kind of just uh, we'll talk about some of the outputs. I have a slide here that was about manual versus automatic. A few notes that we want to remember about manual inertia relief is that the support card entry is required and in automatic it's not required. Uh, same with the uh, ground point. Manual inertia relief requires a ground point and automatic does not, but it will affect your output. So when choosing to run inertia relief, you actually get additional output in your FO6 file, which is very useful. You're going to get a grid point weight generator. Uh, you'll get O load result. And if you're running manual inertia relief, you'll get a user information message. And then you'll get intermediate matrices, QR, QRL, and URA. So the grid point weight generator is summed about uh, your ground point, about the origin by default. It'll tell you your reference point at the top for here. This one is about the origin. And this is uh, the total rigid body mass of your model. So when you submit a job to NASTRAN uh, using inertia relief, you're going to get this mass matrix. It's a six by six mass matrix the model that you submitted. This is very good to look at because you want to make sure that uh, the mass that you of your of your model that you want to be running is actually getting written into NASTRAN. It's a good check to make sure that you have the correct mass, especially if you're using run groups, because it's uh, NASTRAN is going to use this matrix in the inertia relief calculations to balance your model. After our grid point weight generator, it's going to be our O load result. This is where uh, kind of the accelerations are going to calculate for the inertia relief. Um, there's seven sections to the O load result. The first section shows the resultants of the applied loads on your model, which are summed about the ground point. So in our case, we applied a uh, uh, we applied lift to our wings, so those applied loads are going to be shown here as a result in, in section one. And now the next seven sections or, or the next six sections, two through seven, are going to be the necessary loads that are required to impose a unit acceleration in that direction. So 
two, three, and four are your translational directions, X, Y, and Z. And then five, six, and seven are your rotational directions in X, Y, and Z. If you're running manual nurse relief, you'll get a user information message uh, 3035. And this happens right after the OLOAD result. And it gives you values called epsilon and strain energy. So it gives you a value for each degree of freedom that you specified on your support card. So if we remember from the demo, in my case, we uh, we constrained all six degrees of freedom on our support card. So we're going to get six values for epsilon and six values for strain energy. This is a very important check to make if you're running manual nurse relief. We want to make sure that these numbers are very small, especially our epsilon values. Our epsilon values should be, for the most part, the zero. They're never going to be exactly zero because of round off error, but you know, e to the minus 12 is basically zero. It's very small. This is an important check to do when you're running manual nurse relief. So following that, we're going to have our intermediate matrices. There's three that are going to get printed out. The first one is the QRR matrix. So the QRR matrix is the total rigid body mass of our structure. The QRL matrix is the resultant of our apparent reaction loads. This is what's getting applied to counteract our uh, rigid body accelerations. This is what inertia relief is actually applying to your model. These uh, forces in the QRL matrix should be equal and opposite to the loads that you saw in your O load resultant. And the last one is our URA matrix. This is the rigid body acceleration matrix that is actually computed from the applied loads. Um, this is a good one to check, and I always check this when I'm setting up my load cases to make sure that I'm actually running uh, the load factors on my model that I'm wanting to run, right? So if I'm putting three and a half Gs on my model, I would use this T3 acceleration to check to make sure I'm actually running three and a half Gs. Now it's worth noting that this is going to be all about the ground point that you specify in your model. Typically what I like to do is create a node at my CG location and set that as my ground point because then everything gets sewn about your CG and then these accelerations will be easy to understand. If everything is summed about the origin, then my T3 acceleration might not necessarily be 3.5 Gs uh, in that reference frame. And it might be confusing. You'd actually have to do some extra math to kind of back it out. So for, uh, you know, it, it, it's just best to put it at the, at the CG. It makes everything easier. Uh, so how is that data helpful? How, how can we be using this output data? Well, the first is that we're going to be verifying that uh, what we're running is, is correct. So like I mentioned, the load factor be, is being applied correctly. Uh, verifying that you have the correct mass in your FEM. And you're also going to be able to use it to verify the quality of your model and the accuracy of your results. Um, that's like using those epsilon and strain values, you want to make sure that those are low. If those seem fairly high, then it's possible that your support card might not be defined correctly. Another thing that could be useful is if you possibly needed to use any of those accelerations in any outside calculations. Um, well, now you could use uh, those six accelerations um, directly from the load case that you had applied uh, in your FAM. So these are some of the useful things uh, that you can do with inertia relief uh, inside NX NASTRAN and, and FEMAP. Um, so that concludes uh, our webinar on inertia relief. Um,
I'm going to open it up for questions now. I think I'll pass it back to Ashran. All right. All right, thanks, thanks. So I just wanted to quickly go over um, structural design analysis, which is um, where we work. And so we're hosting this uh, webinar. And just a little bit about us, there's uh, two primary sides of our business. We have 13 engineers here that are doing structural analysis for primarily aerospace and um, companies and also working with some marine and other applications. And so to do that analysis, we're using BMAP and NASTRAN every day, as well as some other Siemens products like um, SimSatter 3D. And we also are a reseller for Collier Research Corporation's Hypersizer, which uh, some of you in the aerospace industry might be familiar with. So since we're using that software every day, we are a value-added reseller for Siemens. We are a certified smart partner for BMAP and NX Nastran. And what that means is that we're providing the software, the training, and support for these products. We actually have a um, BMAP training class that's coming up on May 7th through 9th, but we run one of those every quarter. And just providing um, high-level value with these webinars and any demos that our customers need, we specifically cater our training and uh, education towards them. So as uh, Nick is going through that, he's looking through the questions. So on in the GoToWebinar panel, you'll see that there's a questions box, so um, at this time, if you just want to put any questions that you have in there, and Nick will look over it and answer it. And before I pass it back, I just want to mention that we will be sending out the slides and recording for this webinar by tomorrow. So um, if you want to look at the recording, please look that over. And once you close the webinar today, there will be a survey. So if you could answer some of those questions, it would be greatly appreciated. So now I'm going to pass it back to Nick. Thank you, Austin. So I see one question in here, um, and it looks like he withdrew his question. I'll read it out anyway, though. You said for the rudder kick there. Um, you asked about any of the DLM aerodynamics, um, but like you had mentioned, uh, I was running uh, Static Solution 101, so I wasn't using any of the uh, aeroelastic uh, solutions. I got another question coming in. Can you use a combination of SPC constraints and support card to run inertia relief? An example would be analyzing a two point lift fixture. That SPC constraints would constrain translations and support card for rotation. So this can be done, yes. Basically, when you're defining your support card, you think of it as what degrees of freedom do you want the inertia relief to cancel out with accelerations? Um, so if you wanted to go ahead and constrain some with an SPC and then have inertia relief balance out the other ones, you can do that. But it has to be done with manual inertia relief, which would be param uh, in rail minus one. Looks like that's all the questions I have for right now. Um, if you have any other questions uh, about any of the material covered today, uh, please feel free to send me an email. I'll leave my contact information down here. It's just nmelig at structures.aero. And also, if you have any questions regarding any pricing or see a demo, uh, you please contact our director of sales, Marty Civic. Uh, I've also left his information here up on the screen. So thank you everyone for coming to our webinar and hope to see you next time.